Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Butzel Long's webinar, Response to the Spread of COVID-19, the Impact on Employment of Foreign Nationals. During this morning's presentation, please feel free to submit questions to the presenters using the GoToWebinar control panel. Our presenters will answer as many questions as they can at the end of the webinar, time permitting. Also, a copy of this presentation will be made available this afternoon on the webinar event page and Butzel Long's Coronavirus Resource Center on Butzel.com. So with that housekeeping out of the way, I would like to introduce Butzel Long shareholders, Linda Armstrong, Claire Major, and Reggie Passas. Linda? Thank you, Jonathan, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. We appreciate that. I think we would all agree with the impact of COVID-19, employers and employees are facing some pretty challenging times. We're encountering situations we may have never imagined. Who would have imagined that the world really was shutting down? Um, however, in spite of this, employers want to retain talent and foreign nationals want to maintain their stay. They want to remain in the United States illegally. And in many cases, they want to obtain permanent residence status. We're in a situation now where their travel bans are in place all over the world. Pretty much all of the countries have closed their borders. Uh, consulates around the world have suspended processing of visa applications. Uh, USCIS field offices are currently closed. Premium processing has been suspended for processing of certain applications. But kind of a light in the storm is the USCIS regional offices, at least today, those officers are the ones that process extensions of stay, change of employer, change of status. They're still operating. So as long as they're operating, we're permitted to file petitions, which is a good thing. Um, somewhat problematic is that to date, the USCIS and the Department of Labor have provided very little or no guidance regarding the impact of COVID-19 on the employment of foreign nationals and their status in the United States. So what is an employer to do? Uh, this morning, Clara and Reggie are gonna spend a good deal of time talking about the impact of furloughs and layoffs on foreign nationals in the most utilized current classifications, and Clara will discuss what those are. Um, we're also going to talk about options available for foreign nationals to maintain their status and employers to retain their talent. Then I will follow up with changes to the Form I-9, which is actually beneficial to uh, US employers, and then provide some recent updates from the government um, as recent as yesterday. So right now I'd like to turn it over to Clara, who's gonna discuss the non-immigrant classifications and the impact of furloughs and layoffs on the US workforce. So Clara? Yes, good morning. Um, yeah, my, um, my presentation will focus um, on H-1B employees, but before I get to the specifics on the H-1B, I just want to go through uh, quickly the um, classifications that uh, um, employers frequently use to hire foreign nationals in the U.S. Uh, of course, there's the H-1B employees in specialty occupation. Um, L-1A and L-1B, those are intercompany transfers and executive manager or specialized knowledge positions. There's um, E-2, treaty investors or employees of treaty investors. I, I haven't included that on my slides, but there's an E-3 also, which is uh, uh, for Australian uh, citizens, that's uh, uh, an option for them. Um, all one, we're seeing more all ones uh, uh, with the H-1B being capped, uh, new H-1Bs being capped by the lottery. All one has become something that we look at and that's for employees with extraordinary ability. You know, that's all based on what credentials they have and what positions they fill but it is something that we are looking at more often than in the past. TN for Canadians and TN2 for Mexican nationals, those are the NAFTA professionals. And then um, the F1 OPT, which has uh, been very uh, popular for um, employers when they are uh, hiring students with um, optional practical training, and also if they are in a STEM, uh, um, STEM degree, uh, obtaining um, you know the stem extensions uh, as I said earlier my focus is going to be on the h1b um, 
One of the things about an H-1B, we have gotten um, many questions about the H-1Bs. It's unique because it uh, part of the H-1B uh, filing requires a labor condition application. And if you think of this as the guidance uh, of how the employee is going to work, where they will work, how many hours, what wage. And so with the labor condition um, application or LCA, uh, there are um, certain attestations that the employer makes. One, the employer must pay the H-1B, the required wage, even during non-productive status. Uh, the employer must provide the H-1B workers with the same working condition and benefits offered to similarly employed U.S. workers. Uh, the employer must attest that the employment of the H-1B worker will not adversely affect the working conditions, and that's hours, vacations, benefits of similarly employed U.S. workers. Um, the employer must also attest that there's no strike, lockout, or work stoppage on the date the LCA is filed. And finally, the employer must provide notice of the filing of the LCA to the um, employee. The employer must provide it, uh, the H-1B worker, with a copy of the LCA. Now, before I leave this um, slide, uh, I, I do want to say that the um, the labor condition application is a very important document. Uh, if um, companies have used this, they know that there's that wage analysis. You have to list the place of employment, uh, the address, uh, and if it's full-time, part-time, et cetera. It's very important. So for H-1B employees, uh, we are focusing more on what does the initial labor condition application provide and how does that guide the employer um, in terms of uh, these difficult times and what can they do uh, to uh, maybe uh, change the LCA. So next. Raji, okay. So, oh. So for H-1B, I think uh, if you have employees in H-1B, you know you cannot bench an employee. You need to pay the employee based on the terms of the LCA. Now there is an exception if the employee requests an unpaid leave for some personal um, uh, reasons. For example, they may want some time off to go to India and get married and come back a month later or they have a, an illness in the family that they um, need to go home for, um, you know, back to their home country. So in that situation, uh, uh, you can have unproductive work because the employee has requested in writing um, this uh, unpaid leave. Now, one, uh, one thing additionally regarding benching employees and unpaid leaves here, we have had the question, well, can I ask my employees during this time of the coronavirus to request um, um, an unpaid leave? Well, I think that's a little bit uh, coercive in a way. Uh, uh, the unpaid leave request has to be from the employee. It has to be made for a legitimate reason that the employee has, not just to accommodate a, a two-week furlough. Now, what can you do if you do have uh, a situation where you have an LCA that's for a full-time uh, work? Uh, we have often suggested, because we've seen this situation before in uh, economic times where employers had to reduce hours that the employee was working. And so it is possible to get a new labor condition application, new posting, and file an amended petition to reflect reduction in hours. And the reduction in hours can, can be as, as low as you want them to be. Uh, it can uh, be a range in hours, uh, but whatever the minimum hours, that is the number of hours that the individual H-1B employee can work and must be paid for. So another issue that comes up with the H-1B, um, mm, go back Reggie, please that comes up with the H-1B is, uh, is uh, you know, working remotely. Um, 
in working remotely uh, as an employer you need to confirm uh, at what location they are working many are working from home and so it's important to determine whether that location is in the same msa metropolitan statistical area as the location that was listed in the original lca and then you have to evaluate if a new lca is required if posting is required at the remote location and if an amended petition needs to be filed. Next. Um, so I have, um, I'm gonna propose four, four scenarios to kind of clarify what employers should be thinking about uh, when uh, furloughing H-1B employees. So you have a scenario one, there's no furlough and the employee works remotely at full pay. So the, uh, let me just mention the 60 day grace period for H-1B as well as other foreign nationals working on, um, on a uh, work uh, classification. Uh, if they are terminated or laid off, they have a 60 day grace period. And during this grace period, they're not allowed to work but they are um, in status and can look for another um, employer. And in some instances can go back to work with the original employee that filed the H-1B. So the 60 day period is very important. It uh, can be triggered one time during what is called an authorized period of stay. Um, but it's the, it cannot go beyond the end of their status or their I-94 card expiration. So no furlough, employee works remotely at full pay. The employee does not trigger the 60-day grace period. The uh, employer should determine if the remote work location is in the same MSA as the initial labor condition application. If the remote work location is not in the same MSA, then you have to determine if a new labor condition application and posting are required. Um, now, it seems extreme, you know, they're working from home, but the rules for LCA and uh, the LCA that was initially filed will list a, an employment location. And so the reason for having to do this analysis is to see whether or not the wage is still um, correct. Next. Scenario two, you furlough the employee for two weeks with pay. The, H1, uh, the H-1B employee does not trigger the 60-day grace period and um, the employee can resume work after the two-week furlough. This is uh, similar to benching with pay. Next. Um, scenario three, you furlough the employee for two weeks without pay. In this instance, the employee triggers the 60-day grace period because you are, in effect, benching the employee for two weeks without pay, which is not permitted under the labor condition application. Now, if the H-1B petition is not revoked and the LCA is not withdrawn, the employer can rehire the employee during the 60-day grace period. Now, the issue here is that the employee may complain to the Department of Labor at some point and, and indicate that they were benched for two weeks, uh, and the employer may uh, need to uh, may be responsible for back pay and penalties. So um, for, uh, I, we don't recommend furlough an employee without pay. And the third and the fourth scenario is next, Reggie. The fourth scenario is if the employer decides to terminate the employee. Now, um, according to the regulations, to per, the employer uh, to protect themselves against uh, claims for back wages. They need to send a letter to the USCIS requesting, notifying them that the employee has been terminated. In that instance, the USCIS will revoke the H-1B petition. And although not required by regulation, the, many employers also withdraw the labor condition application, just as a matter of prudence. Um, 
what we have found is that some employers will risk the issue of back wages um, and not notify, not have the H-1B petition revoked uh, with the hope that, uh, you know, they, they may plan to rehire the person during the 60-day grace period. Now, uh, I didn't include it there, but the H1, in this scenario, yes, they do get the 60-day grace period. Next. Here it is. Yeah, if the petition is not revoked and the LCA is not withdrawn, the employer can rehire during the 60-day grace period. And again, this grace period can only be used once during an authorized period of stay. And if the I-94 card expires before the 60-day period, the I-94 card controls, that date controls. Uh, if the petition is revoked and the LCA is withdrawn, the employer can always file a new H-1B petition within the 60-day grace period and rehire the employee. Now, I do want to make a um, next, Reggie. Okay, before I uh, have Reggie <clears throat> take over uh, the presentation, I do want to mention something about um, it's called short-term placement and under the labor condition application you, uh, an employer can uh, temporarily place an h1b employee in a place of employment not listed in the labor condition application um, you do not need to file a new lca for the temporary gra uh, geographic area of employment the pay required is the wage rate that's listed in the LCA. Uh, and then there's some other requirements uh, for short-term placement. Short-term placement can be for up to 30 days. Now, this coronavirus situation is um, unique. Uh, and so we are looking at the short-term placement option as a, um, as a possible argument to have the person work remotely at their home or at another location for up to 30 days without having to file a labor condition application. So I just want that out there so that um, it's an option that uh, can be discussed further. Unfortunately, we can't discuss case specific um, matters, but um, are happy to take um, calls and help you to navigate these uh, issues. Amended petitions, um, that is an option to keep the person in status and, uh, you know, change the uh, the um, number of hours that they can work. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Reggie, uh, who will uh, continue the discussion regarding other um, statuses. Thank you. Thanks, Clara. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about are the non h1b classifications and those consist those whoops this, sorry this thing's a little touchy um those consist of the l1 which is the intercompany transfer you're transferring from one office subsidiary um parent or affiliate that's in the uh, outside the united states to an office or parent or subsidiary or uh, affiliate in the united states then there's the E, and I'm going to restrict my comments mainly to the E1 and E2, which are the treaty trader, treaty investor. The treaty, uh, basically, an E classification is authorized where the foreign national shares the same nationality as the ownership of the U.S. entity. Uh, Clara alluded earlier to the E3 classification, which is a bit of a different classification than the E1 or E2. The E3, just so you know. A lot of what Clara said said about the um, H-1B classification pertains to the E-3 classification for Australian nationals because uh, as part of that petition, a labor condition application is required for either the petition that's filed with the Immigration Service or the visa application that's filed at one of the U.S. consulates, usually in Australia. And uh, as was alluded to in Linda's introductory comments, um, all consulates for, from for for better, just for better understanding, are pretty much shut down for routine services such as applying for a visa. They are open for some emergency uh, guidance or emergency contact for US citizens, but uh, business as usual is pretty much out of the question. And actually those foreign countries have their own restrictions and quarantine um, requirements. So you're gonna have to uh, consult with an immigration lawyer and we'd be happy to at least start the discussion on that. 
um, individually, um, because each com each country has its own quarantine provision regarding nationals of its own country returning home or foreign nationals trying to seek admission into the uh, into that country. Then there's the TN classification. Um, TN all it stands for is Treaty NAFTA. This covers Canadians, and this also covers Mexicans. So a TN1 is actually Canadians, TN2 are for Mexicans, but I will just refer to them as the TN. The 01 classification is the Alien of Extraordinary Ability classification. So that's basically someone who's in the top 10% of their field. It could be a scientist, it could be an artist, it could be a, um, it could be a, 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 a performer or a player of some kind uh, in, a, in a professional setting, um, Olympic, a gold Olympian, for example. Um, that could be um, that that covers that classification. And then there's the then there's the P status, which is like your player performer, who's not quite extraordinary ability level, but is someone who performs and um, or plays uh, professionally, is a, who's a foreign national. And also the interesting thing about that one is it also it allows for certain essential support personnel for that performer um, to come along. So the key point here is um, what people we have to be constantly reminded of, and we always have to think about this too as immigration lawyers, is that all of these classifications have a component called non-immigrant intent, okay? Well, let's start with the intent part first. Intent means what your what is your mental state? What is it exactly in your mind? What is your intention in coming to the United States, okay? So, and your intent to qualify for any of these classifications, H, L, E, T, N, O, P, you have to have non-immigrant intent. What does that mean? It means you do not intend to stay here permanently, i.e. you do not intend to stay here and get a green card. Now, there are only two classifications that allow for a person to have this immigrant intent, green card intent, at the same time as non-immigrant intent, and that's, that's the L1 and the H1B, all right? Those are the only two classifications that allow a person to say, I'm coming in only to work as an H specialty occupation as an engineer, or I'm the only I only come in to intend to be transferred over to as a multinational manager or specialized knowledge worker, but I may want to get my green card. The other classifications, if you're an E, TN, O, P, um, or even E3, if you intend to get a green card or at certain stages of the green card process, they could technically refuse you entry because you do not, you no longer have non-immigrant intent. Okay, another thing to consider is that our immigration system is a sponsorship system. We get lots of calls from people all the time saying, I want to stay here permanently. I want to get my green card. Well, we always ask what, who's going to be your, your sponsor. So for foreign nationals who are getting sponsorship through the family base of immigration, you have um, the most clear situation is if you're married to a U.S. citizen spouse. Okay, that person becomes your sponsor. And then, then there's a list of priority categories which, which, uh, which you would go through like with U.S. citizen spouses being the highest priority and brothers and sisters of, uh, of U.S. citizens being the lowest category. And your wait time in the line depends upon how high or how low you are in that priority category. Just to give you an example, if you're here in the United States and you're married to a U.S. citizen, under normal circumstances, not under COVID-19 circumstances, but under normal circumstances, we could file, start the green card process, your U.S. citizen spouse could petition for you, and at the same time, you could file for your green card. You could wait here until you have an interview, say, six to eight months away, all right? But if you're the brother and sister of a U.S. citizen, um, that's a long wait. Just to give you an example, um, Filipinos who have been, you know, who have sponsored their, their brothers and sisters who are outside the United States, um, generally, it's a they're working in, in, a, in a petition on, on petition cases that were approved back in the 80s. I think we're almost in the 90s now. So that's a pretty long wait. So that's how significant the sponsorship system could be. It's a priority system. The other thing too is um, maintaining status. Everyone thinks, um, well, I care about the visa. Well, you know, the visa that's in the passport that's issued by the U.S. consulate, all that does is it allows us to enter the United States. Once we're in the United States, then our status controls. So I use the analogy a lot of times when I'm talking with this. I like to talk about it. I use analogies when I'm talking about things. Is say you use your Visa card to buy something, and I ask you, show me some proof that you own that cup or computer or whatever it is you bought. 
you would not normally show me your Visa card that you use to buy it. All that allowed you to do was to procure and purchase the item in question. Well, the Visa, all it does is allow you to procure your entry into the United States. Your status is what controls while you're in the United States. Just like the receipt of what you purchase shows that you own the item, or if you purchase some property, the title of that property would show that you own that property, not your funds that, that you use to buy it. Okay, so maintaining status while you're here in the United States is what controls. And the reason why maintaining status is a big deal is because if you are in status, you are what we call lawfully present. If you are unlawfully present, that's a big problem because if you are unlawfully present for 180 days or your employee is unlawfully present for 180 days and, you're, and you leave the country to either a business trip on your own or you're physically removed from the United States, you are barred from returning for three years. If you are unlawfully present for one year or 365 days, and that's a cumulative one year, so a cumulative 365 days, that means when you leave the United States, again, either by accident, on purpose, or um, not through your own uh, choice, in other words, remote deportation removal, you are barred for 10 years from returning to the United States. And again, that's a cumulative 365 days. So if you have 180 days here, 180 days there, and they all add up during your time while you had immigrant, you know, non-immigrant status to 365 days, then you could be facing a 10-year bar. So that's why it's such a big deal to be maintaining status. The other part of maintaining status is you have to, uh, for at least the, so I talked about the family-based sponsorship with the U.S. citizen route, and when I demonstrated the priority things. There's also government sponsorship, which is like if you went to the asylum, but the main one that we're focused on here is the employment sponsorship, right? So, so an employer sponsors you for an H-1B, an L-1, an E, or TN, and you're here in the United States, or even started the green card process for you, all right? What we're talking about here to maintain status, among those other things that we talked about, you have to also maintain your employer or employee relationship. In fact, the employer or employee relationship is very much like a lifeline for the employee to stay in the United States. So again, I like to stick with analogies. That's why I have a little spaceman hooked up with his lifeline to the space shuttle or space vehicle, because if you cut that line, what happens to the astronaut? He floats or she floats away and you lose them. So what we're talking about here is maintaining that lifeline to the employee. Now, keep in mind, as Clara and both Linda have said, the government has never experienced a situation like this before where we're facing a pandemic and it's affecting everyone's ability to work in the United States, okay? So the rules were set up not to, obviously not to account for pandemics. The rules were set up to determine whether an employer or an employee severs their relationship or and how to do, to, to what degree do they sever their relationship um, by either choice of the employer or choice of the employee, okay? They were never set up by where the employer or employee's choice was taken away from them due to a pandemic reg regulations in their various states and the federal government. So keep that in mind, but we do have some rules to go by in terms of maintaining the lifeline to the employer or employee. So I use this analogy again with, see that uh, wire there, there are many wires inside of it. So the idea is to use the analogy that you don't want to fully cut the wire or the lifeline, otherwise you end up with the employee who's no longer in status because their sponsorship is gone. So what are the things um, that you can do to hopefully avoid completely cutting the lifeline or what are the things that completely, um, that are things to think about? Again, what we're talking about here is putting the person's immigration status and the employer situation should you want to resume regular employment when everything gets back to normal. We're talking about things that will put the case in a defendable position should either the Department of Labor or the Immigration Service decide to say audit the company to see how many people maintain their status with the company or the employee if they're faced before an immigration officer at some future date and they're traveling into the United States, what factors would they look at to determine whether or not the employer and employee maintain the necessary relationship to maintain that immigration status, which in turn maintained 
the lawful presence in the United States to avoid the three or 10 year bar, okay? So the first thing you can always consider is make no change. Continue to keep the employee employed. Obviously that means the lifeline is untouched by any factor that could possibly, that an immigration officer or department labor officer could use to say that there's any status that's anything that's been affected the status of the employee, right? So there's no change. That's the best circumstances. And that's the circumstances I think any immigration lawyer would say, if you can do it at all costs, try and do that. Of course, we're facing a situation with many challenges and employers and employees are faced with having to make some very difficult decisions regarding maintaining its workforce. Um, and foreign nationals bring with them issues of immigration issues of additional challenges. So the next thing is reduction in pay. Again, I'm only speaking for the non H-1B and E-3 classifications because those two classifications, again, are a little bit more regulated in this area on reduction in pay because of the fact that there's a labor condition application filed. So reduction in pay. So when you file any petition, you are signing under penalty of perjury that you are going to be, the employer is going to be paying the salary of this person. However, certain things are not considered material changes. So I will tell you that for L1s so far, it has never been determined that a change in pay has been a material change requiring a refiling of an L1 petition. For instance, what is a material change? Well, if there's a change, let's say if you're an L1A and you're a multinational manager and you're managing professionals and you get demoted, but you're also a technical specialist and you get demoted to, to a person who is a technical specialist because you hold a patent on a particular uh, approach or device. So you've now gone from managing no managing people to managing no one, becoming a technical specialist, that may be a material change, okay? Or if you're an E2 essential skill worker, and now you're gonna become a manager, or um, that may be considered an essential uh, a material change. Um, that one's a little bit less of an argument, but I mean, that's an example, all right? In either of those cases, reduction of pay has never been determined to be a, um, a material change. However, um, you know, they could, they could have say a reduction of pay if it's significant, if it's down to zero, that could be enough to say that there was a material change there. I mean, if it's a, re it's got, you know, with anything with the immigration service, you have to make an argument that it's a reasonable reduction in pay in light of what was going on with this COVID-19 situation. Okay, now furlough. Again, furlough uh, assumes that you are still maintaining an employer-employee relationship, but you've kind of suspended them from working, um, providing, providing productive services for the employer. Technically, again, for the non-H and E3 classifications, that does not, that there's been not, no decision yet that has said that you cannot furlough employees, particularly in the face of a pandemic, okay? Um, however, it is again one line in that cord that could be cut, that could sever, you know, that the that the uh, immigration service, Department of Labor, or uh, maybe a, a adjudicating authority, immigration judge, or whatever, could determine that that's the one that cuts the cuts the lifeline to the employee. But that's something to be considered. A change of hours, say you're you're reducing someone's hours from 40 hours a week to 20 hours a week. Again, that's not been considered. Um, in general, um, uh, 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 cutting the employer-employee relationship uh, by itself. Um, again, most of the time when you file a petition, you're certifying that that they're, you're putting the hours there, full-time employment. But again, it does not affect whether a person was a multinational manager coming from a foreign national, a foreign office to a U.S. office, or it doesn't affect the nationality in the case of an E, or it doesn't affect the the um, um, extraordinary ability status of the O-1, okay? Um, change of status. So um, now the next thing is the tricky one, okay? Filing for unemployment, okay? So, you know, all I'll say on filing unemployment, I, I think Claire may have mentioned this earlier in her comments, is that, you know, you really should consult with a labor and employment lawyer regarding whether a foreign national is eligible for unemployment. It's very clear that green card holders are eligible for unemployment. Um, the designate unemployment is controlled state by state. And, um, you know, we can't say what all 50 states would say because they all have different rules and stuff. So, um, but you should definitely consult with the uh, labor employment regarding filing on volume. But let's just say for the sake of argument that you can, that your employees can file employment. All right. Um, and actually one labor and employment lawyer 
suggested to me, if you if you have some questions on this, set up an unemployment account. And if the, it was a practical solution, if the computer allows you to, the computer system allows you to get to the unemployment um, end of a uh, system, allows you to file it, then at least from a practical standpoint, you have that answer. But let's just say for the sake of our, you can. And I'm not saying you can, but let's just say for the sake of our, you can. Should you file for unemployment? Okay, because if you file for an employment or the employee files for unemployment and you set up the account for the unemployment, the problem there is you're pretty much signifying that the, the employer employee relationship has been severed. Okay, so you have to be very careful about that. All right, and then you may, you may be triggering the um, 60 day grace period that Clara was alluding to in the H1Bs um, that they now, you now have 60 days. So those, you know, if you do one or two of these things, you know, you have a good argument to defend that you're maintaining an employer-employee relationship for the employee. But if you do all these things, then you're really cutting the various wires inside the lifeline to the point where you probably may have just cut the lifeline to the employee and severed the, the relationship between the employer and the employee. Okay. Now, a word about foreign students, because they're a little bit of a different situation than, um, than the foreign nationals I just discussed. So foreign students, um, you know, again, foreign students are non-immigrant um, students, non-immigrant uh, class, uh, non classification. They, um, they've told the government they only intend to go to school at the various sponsoring university, right? And they will attend full-time credit. At the end of their graduation, they're eligible, to, close to their graduation, or I should say post-graduation, they're eligible for what's called optional practical training, OPT. Okay, that allows them to work in a field that's related to their curriculum that they studied in school to give them practical training in their field. All right. And then at the end of their OPT, some um, employers who are authorized under E-Verify, um, and again, that's a whole other seminar, so we'll have to leave that one right there. But if there are some employers who are, who are, who are registered under the E-Verify system and the foreign national student studied and would be working in a science, technology, engineering, and mathematics field are allowed practical training beyond the initial year after graduation, okay? So um, in those instances, um, if you're in a situation where you have to lay off or go through this analysis of whether you have to restructure their employment, they are only allowed, in the first year of OPT after graduation, they're only allowed uh, up to 90 days of unemployment, okay? Now, if they're also an OPT STEM um, foreign national student, they're allowed an additional 60 days of unemployment on top of the 90 days, okay? However, you must notify the university who has sponsored the foreign national student of a significant change of their training plans, okay? So you have to be very careful there um, to notify the university because most universities, as we know, are on minimal staff right now as well and working remotely. So um, be very careful there. So it looks like there, if you had 90 plus 60, that a STEM OPT could be eligible to 150 days, but there are some catches to that. I've kind of mentioned a few of them in that you know, the 90 days is for the first year, and then the OPT STEM, that to be in the STEM field, and they have to be working for an employer who's an E-Verify employer, and they have to notify the university um, of the, um, change of training plans, and they're only allowed 60 days of additional unemployment, okay? So that's a word on a few foreign students. Okay, now, last resort options, okay? So, um, you know, keep in mind, you know, when you're considering completely laying off uh, people uh, or engaging in one of the factors towards laying off those people, you have to be very careful, because this is, I mean, I don't want people to think, oh, this is the hard and fast rule. Again, this is about defending the employer and the employee that they were still maintaining their immigration status or their ability to stay in the United States, okay? So that 60 day grace period comes into play here, okay? So one way to protect it, for instance, in an L1A or L1B situation, if it's possible to send them to the, to the country abroad where they went or even, or even to their home country, all right? They can't be out of status in the United States if they're not in the United States. Okay, I'll say that again because that's a little confusing. They can't be out of status, considered out of status in the United States if they're not in the United States. So the idea there is for them to not accrue any unlawful presence, but be outside the United States while they're doing it. So to send the L1A, L1B intercompany transfer manager or a specialized knowledge 
to the company abroad if their home country allows them to come in. Um, and secondly, that you know, similarly um, with TN or TN2s, so Canadians or Mexicans, if it's possible for them to return home to Canada or Mexico, we happen to be fortunate that we're living in the Metro Detroit area. So some foreign nationals have opted to stay in Canada, not having to worry about whether they're lawfully present in the United States because of the fact that they're in Canada. So that's one thing to consider. Again, quarantine considerations. Um, you have to be careful of that because some, like I just heard a global uh, presentation from a colleague in Australia, and they have very strict uh, uh, situations from even foreign, from Australian nationals returning to their home country where they have to stay in quarantine for up to 14 days. And uh, you have to be very careful whether those home countries or the country that you intend to send people to will allow that foreign national into their to that country. Um, if it's a citizen of that country that you plan to send them to, then there's a high degree of chance that they will probably be admitted, although they may have to comply with some quarantine provisions. But if it's, say, a, a Canadian or a, a French national returning to a German subsidiary or a German subsidiary office outside, that's going to be very difficult because German Germany right now is not allowing any foreign national, non-Germans into the United States subject to very limited restrictions. And again, these restrictions are changing day by day as the COVID-19 virus progresses, progresses through each country. Okay. So generally what triggers, what, what the, the grace periods were in, in, uh, intended for was the termination of the foreign national employee. Okay. So you terminate the foreign national employee, that, trigger, that starts the grace period clock, that's in the 60 days, okay? So if you've severed all the lines in that previous slide I told you about, you've started the clock, okay? The employment employee has a, and defendant family members have a 60-day grace period to legally remain in the United States. They cannot work during this time, okay? That allows them, the way those, those, the, the grace period regulations were allowed was to allow them time to find a new employer to take up their sponsorship to sponsor their immigration status so that they could stay in the United States longer than the 60 days. But in this situation, there may be a situation where you have to either rely on the grace period, then resume their employment, or you may have to allow for the grace period, but then file a new H-1B so that later on they have another 60 days. Because the thing is, um, so let's just say, let's just go to that next person. First is any employee can rehire during the 60 days period as long as they're eligible. And what does that mean they're eligible? So if you have a foreign national who here is an L, gets terminated, triggers the 60 days, okay? And then they join a different company, completely unrelated to the family of employees that was related to the L's petition sponsor. You're looking at another classification because the L won't work for them because that new company is unrelated to the companies that sponsored for the L. Or let's take an E employee, for example. Say it's a German national company and a German national. So you have a German national who decides to join a French company or an American company. They can't do it under an E, okay? They can only do it under another classification. And the only classification, which is very limited right now, is the H-1B um, for a variety of different reasons. And again, that's a different seminar. So you have to be very careful with respect to a foreign national going to join a new employee because you have to look and see if it's related to the existing company, if it's an L. You have to look and see if there's a nationality issue with respect to an E. Um, if it's an H, if it's an H person who's leaving a company, was terminated and going to another company which requires an H, then that's not a problem, all right? Or if it's an L company that's going to another L-related um, L uh, com uh, company that's related to the L petitioner initially, then you're okay. Or if it's an E company, let's say it's a that take that German national uh, employee I was talking about, and they're going to join a new German national company, that's fine too. So you got to really watch that, okay? And then the thing is, if they um, if they um, go into a um, situation where you know you only this 60 day period is only um, you, you know is only valid for one thing. So I was I was talking about you know, how you need to file petitions, you have to be very careful with that because like if you have an L, an H probably won't work. If you have an E, an H probably won't work. But if you have an E going to an E, that would probably work. So that's why you gotta really pay attention to where, where which employer they're going to. So those are some last resort options. So that here's some, whoops, here's some more on um, last resort options, okay? So, so again, the whole point of that 60 day grace period is to find another employer during that 60 day grace period. All right. 
Um, and in some classification, once you use that 60 grace period, it's generally gone unless the employer rehiring the person or the new employer establishes a new position that reestablishes a possible future 60 day grace period if they get laid off. Okay. So say I lay off someone who's an H, all right. Um, and then they join another company for an H. Then they get laid off from that second company. They don't have that 60 grace period unless, um, unless that new company, which they would be required to do, get a, gets a new H, in which case they would have the 60 day grace period. All right. So you got to be very careful of that. That. So um, actually, that's a bad example. So that's a bad example because the H-1B employer would have to require, have to file for an H-1B anyway. But let's say if it's a H-1B employer, the same employer lays them off. They join the they rejoin the same employer as an H, and you don't file a new H-1B. You've exhausted the 60-day grace period, unless that same employer decides to file a new H-1B. Then you've got the 60-day H-1B. So if the employer is not rehired you, and you cannot find a new employer and cannot leave the USD the COVID-19 uh, virus, it is possible to change to visitor status, which will provide time to deal with circumstances related to COVID-19, sell your home, etc. This is a bit of a, again, another last resort strategy. The reason why there are some concerns with it is because when you switch to visitor status, you are losing the protection of the grace periods, the 60 day grace periods. So that's the first thing, because the visitor status does not have a 60 day grace period. It only applies to work authorized immigration classifications. Um, secondly, when the person finds a new employer, okay, well, well, let me take a step back. There is no premium processing for change of status from L1 or H1 to visitor status. So you could be dealing with a four to six, maybe eight month processing time for, for the change of status to visitor. So you're gonna be waiting a while, all right? So the other thing is when they resume the employment and they find a new employer to sponsor them, um, there's still, again, still no premium processing, all right? then you're not only gonna to have to wait for that person to get that H-1B or new L or whatever E approved, but that person will have to explain, well, wait a minute, you filed, you left your company as the H, you filed a change of status to a visitor telling us you intended to leave because you only wanted to stay as a visitor to tidy up things. Now you join a new employer as an H and you say you're going to stay here for another two, three years. How do you explain that discrepancy? The discrepancy of a visitor status versus an employer status. So you really have to watch that um, that strategy. Again, I don't recommend it, but again, these are last resort options. These are desperate measures. So if I know there are lawyers who are advocating for this strategy, but be care, be very mindful of this change of status to visitor because remember the immigrant, the intent there is not just non-immigrant intent. It's visitor non-immigrant intent, which means you intend to return home. All right. Now there is another provision. Also, beyond the grace periods, and we've exercised it again, it's like the last resort uh, option as well. You can ask the immigration service for discretion in terms of changing or extending a person's status when there's a period that breaks up the person's status. If the person was not employed during that time, the break of status was not through their own fault. COVID-19 seems to be a good argument. It's never been tried because obviously we're still in COVID-19. Um, uh, COVID-19 lockdown, if you will, right now, but there is that possibility as well. Um, and again, the, all of these factors are to seek the protection um, against a future challenge by the Department of Labor or the Immigration Service to the employer or the employee for the person's immigration status. So these are the important things to know whenever you're consulting with an immigration lawyer regarding um, what you need to know. It's important to know what the person's status is. It's supposed to, important to know what the expiration date of the status it's important to know whether the employee is in the green card process. And it's important to know what stage of the green card process they're in. I won't go into that right now. And it's important to know whether the person has a spouse and children and what their dependent immigration status is. So with that, I'll turn it over to Linda. I know I, I was talking for a while, sorry about that. Hello. Reggie, can you move the slide, please? So I'm gonna change gears a little bit here and maybe give us a little bit of good news 
and some bad news. But what I wanted to talk about first was um, the temporary flexibility of the Form I-9. This is um, somewhat of a surprise to me since I deal with I-9s a lot and they've been so strict with their rules. But on um, March 20th of this year, the Department of Homeland Security published guidance regarding the flexibility in completing the I-9. It applies to employers and workforces or workplaces that are operating remotely. It must be working remotely. If you are working in the office, this does not apply to you. And it defers the physical presence requirement associated with the I-9. So we all know that Section 1 has to be completed by the employee on or before the first day of work. Section 2 has to be completed by the employer within three business days of the date of hire and requires the employee to provide the original documents establishing identity and authorization to work and the employer employee have to be in the same room when the documents are presented by the employee. Now and for the next 60 days from the date of the notice which is March 20th or within three business days after the termination of the national emergency whichever comes first the employee can expect inspect Section 2 documents remotely. This can be done by a fax, a video, an email, but it can be done remotely. The inspection still has to be done within the first three days, um, first three business days of hire, but it doesn't have to be done in person, which is the great news. When you're completing Section 2, you should put COVID-19 as the reason for the physical inspection delay. In Section 2, the box that's entitled additional information that's in the middle of page two that's a box that we never knew what you were supposed to do with before but now um, if you are delaying it because of remote um, working you put COVID-19 as a reason for the uh, delay in looking at the documents in person and then once normal operations resume the employee has to present the section two documents to you within three business days once they do present those documents to you in person, you should write documents physically examined with the date of the inspection in that additional information box. And again, it's in the middle of section two, the middle of the page. If the employer decides to use this option, they must provide a written documentation um, saying that they're doing this um, and that that's your obligation as the employer. Um, I just wanted to, this doesn't have to do with this, but just wanted to make sure that everybody knows that the new uh, there was a new I-9 that was released in uh, January of this year. It has an addition date of 10-21-19. You must start using that new form on May 1st of 2020. Until then, you can use the other edition. So that's some flexibility in the I-9s that we really weren't expecting. Uh, next slide, please. Um, E-Verify also has given us uh, extending some uh, deadlines, which is, again, a surprise, but a welcome surprise. On March 21st, the De uh, Department of Homeland Security announced that they're extending timeframes to resolve Social Security Administration tentative nonconformance, uh, the TNCs, due to office closures. The same thing applies with regard to um, TNCs about Department of Homeland Security issues. Um, if the employee cannot go to get it corrected because the offices are closed. Uh, but I just want to be clear, employers are still required to create an E-Verify case for new hires within three business days of the date of hire, and the employers must use the hire date from the I-9 when creating the form. If the case creation is delayed because of COVID-19 precautions, when you're completing the form, select the other box from the drop-down list and enter COVID-19 as the reason for the delay. But I want to be clear that the employer cannot take any adverse action against an employee because E-Verify is in an interim or an extended interim case. So the bottom line is employees have more time to really take care of these TNCs. Next slide, please. Um, effective um, on the 19th of this month, employers... Well, you went a little too far. Okay, it, I, I guess it'll catch up, but um, effective the 19th of this month, any employers who are served with notices of, uh, notices of inspection with regard uh, issued by the DHS, Reggie, you're one slide behind, and during the month, nope, <laughs> during the month of March, um, they have and they haven't, I'm sorry, effective March 19th, any employers who are served a notice of inspection by DHS during the month of March 
and they have not already responded, they will be granted an automatic extension of 60 days from the effective date. At the end of the 60 days, DHS is going to look at this and see if they need to have um, an extension. Um, other good news, uh, somewhat, is employers who received a USCIS request for evidence or a notice of intent to deny dated March 1 through May 1 may submit responses within 60 calendar dates after the response deadline set forth in the RFE or the notice of intent to deny before the USCIS will take any action. We've requested clarification from the USCIS about this to see that um, if RFEs that are due between March 1 and April 1 will still have the same benefit and we haven't received anything back from uh, the USCIS yet, but that is something that may happen. Um, as of March 18th, the USCIS has suspended all in-person services at a field office like the Detroit field office we have here and any application support center that's through at least April 7th, but we expect that that's going to go further than that. All the oath ceremonies, the US permanent resident interviews, those are all temporarily suspended. The appointments at the field office and the application support center and the oath ceremonies are all going to be automatically um, redone or rescheduled by the USCIS. One important thing that did come in yesterday if you're familiar with the Application Support Center, and the Application Support Center is where you go to be fingerprinted for any kind of immigration benefit, they announced that um, biometrics, they will be reusing previously submitted biometrics if somebody files an application for employment authorization, um, they don't have to go back to have their fingerprints done again. Um, and the one last slide that I have, um, USCIS that we talked about before, premium processing is suspended for all I-129s and I-140s. Um, another good thing um, is that the USCIS is now indicated it will accept uh, documents, filing documents without a wet signature, which means you don't have to have an original signature and you can submit something that has a, a copy of the actual signature. The last thing I wanted to cover um, is satisfactory departure. This is for visa waiver and ESTA individuals. Um, satisfactory departure, as you all know, for visa waiver, you cannot extend the uh, time you stay in the United States under the visa waiver. It's 90 days maximum. But in certain emergency situations, um, they will allow you to stay an additional 30 days. Why this is important is if you have somebody here in the United States and they uh, their I-94 expires and all flights have been canceled. They're just not flying anywhere in the world. You will be able to get an extension or you should be able to get an extension of the 30 days. Now, I know I went through this rather quickly. Um, satisfactory departure is important and it's something that is very good to use if the situation warrants it, but it needs to be an emergency situation. So I'm going to turn this back over to Jonathan to see if we have any questions although we only have two minutes left. So I, I uh, apologize for that. Jonathan? Well, yeah, this is Reggie, actually. We do have a couple of questions in the in the chat room. So the first one's kind of an easy one, I think. Uh, what if the H-1B employee lives in Canada and works from home in Canada remotely for the time being? Um, my first comment is, that's fine. Um, I think you'll have an issue with the posting and the 30-day uh, um, temporary placement issue, but um, that's perfectly fine. Do you guys have any comments on that? Um, well, if he's working in Canada, um, you know, he's outside of the U.S. Um, I mean, he's not violating his status. It would be like someone taking an extended uh, business trip uh, uh, and, and working out of uh, another uh, office outside of the U.S. And as a matter of fact, that time can be recaptured um, because it's uh, outside of the U.S., so it can be recaptured and added to the six-year limit. So I don't think that's a problem. Okay. I agree. All right. Uh, all right. Our next question is uh, furlough without pay that triggers the 60-day grace period the H-1B and LCR are not withdrawn. When you say rehire, you mean an internal process, correct? Nothing to do with immigration, if I understand this correctly. I think the correct. person saying, yeah, that's correct. I think that's correct. Yep. All right. Yeah, that okay. is correct. That's what I right. was saying. You do have that risk of back wages, though, so. 
And then the next uh, person I have is uh, if I have a clinician placed at a location that is closed, can I have them work at another location? We have 18 sites all in the same county. Um, they can work in another Big location, job. but yeah, you just have to see whether or not they're in the um, MSA. And if they are, uh, they're covered by the existing LCA, you might just have to do a posting. If they're not, then, you know, I think the, the rules of um, doing another LCA and posting and possibly an amended petition would be required. Yeah, it's important to note too, with, with respect to the county, it's just because it's at the same county, it still might be a different metropolitan statistical area, MSA. It may be the same MSA, but it may be different. It's something to research. Um, Linda, do you have any comments on that one? No. Okay. Um, okay. With that, I, those are the only three questions that popped up in the chat. Um, and okay. we're at 1101. So. Yep. Um, well, well, thank you very much, everyone who attended today's webinar. Thank you, Linda, Clara, and Reggie for the excellent information. Uh, just as a reminder, a copy of this presentation will be made available on our Butzel.com website and Coronavirus Resource Center, uh, as well as a recording. So thank you everyone for attending and have a great rest of your day.